Hello and uh, welcome everyone to TWT Online. Uh, my name is Siobhan McGurk, I'm an academic and I'm one of the programmers of the migration stream at this year's event. So I'm coming at you live from Liverpool in a glamorous uh, kitchen. Um, so apologies for the kind of strange lighting, um, but it is an absolute uh, honour to um, be talking today with uh, someone who I'm sure is familiar to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, TWC fans out there already, uh, Harsha Walia. Um, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today, Harsha. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm so excited to be in conversation with you. Thank you for the invitation. Fantastic. Yeah, me too. So, um, so my uh, my research specialization is around. Um, LGBTQ experiences of migration, women's experience of migration, and particularly around um, kind of profit making uh, in um, in the migration industry, we could say. And so I, I uh, covered this book, uh, Asylum for Sale, which came out uh, in in kind of very close proximity to uh, to your um, fantastic uh, boardroom and rule. So this is a last book. book. If you haven't uh, read this already, then um, I strongly suggest that you get a a copy of it. I think that the French translation of it just came out uh, this week, so um, congratulations on that. And I think it's testament to um, the relevance, the international uh, relevance uh, of of your work um, and your analysis. Um, and so we're running a little bit late, and apologies for that. Uh, so um, I'm just going to uh, dive right in, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Great. Fantastic. Sorry, you're okay. lagging a little bit, so I might have a delay in my response. Okay, no problem. I'll make sure to uh, pause as well. Um, so I wanted to uh, start off um, by uh, kind of reading a really uh, a, a great line from um, uh, from your book uh, that I think um, sums up uh, a great deal of your your argument, um, but one that we can maybe unpack. Uh, for uh, people tuning in today and in the future, um, because uh, one of the things I'd like to do is kind of um, take away uh, the illusion of uh, borders and nations uh, for, for people uh, listening today and uh, challenge kind of the dominant conception of, uh, of, of nations uh, and borders. And so in your book, you write, borders are an ordering regime both assembling and assembled through racial capitalist accumulation and colonial relations. Can you use that as a starting point to kind of let us know what your vision is for in terms of how we should uh, differently look at borders away from the kind of dominant narrative uh, that we have that kind of naturalize uh, these mm. kinds of inventions? Mm. Thank you for that. And thank you for your work, let me say. Um, I mean, I'd have to say, you know, today, as we are inundated with news about what is going on in Palestine, um, you know, probably one of the, the starkest images that has come out of the past 24 hours is the image of Palestinians and Palestinian fighters literally tearing down Israel's smart AI uh, border wall and technology, right? And those images are such a profound act of resistance by the Palestinian people. Um, it also goes to your point about challenging borders, not only as these kind of symbolic lines on a map, but really challenging borders in the ways in which borders are completely bound up in regimes of colonialism, settler colonialism, and you know the entire world order of the past century. Um, and so I, I would offer that as a starting point about what our futures would look like, right? Our futures would look like liberated areas, liberated people, liberated ecosystems. Um, it would mean not only the dismantling of borders at those sites that borders exist as those kinds of lines on a map, but it would mean disassembling all of the conditions that give rise to border walls and detention centers um, and regimes of exclusion. <laughs> which is what effectively borders are intended to do, right? To create zones of who belongs where, who can live where in the world and under what conditions, um, an ordering of global apartheid in our contemporary era. And so uh, a future of no borders is different than open borders because a no border world calls on us to dismantle all of the ways in which bordering regimes operate far beyond and also within 
uh, the ways that nation states are organized and that contemporary exploitation um, and oppression is present in our colonial present. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at this point about the way that we um, think of borders as lying on the map uh, as being insufficient to really understand the way that um, border violence and uh, exclusionary uh, dynamics worldwide uh, work. So when you when you talk about the kind of the expansive border, uh, the kind of the border that goes far beyond uh, the, the line on the map, um, what, what do you mean? Al? How can we how can we uh, think of um, examples that kind of uh, make that clear for, for people listening in today? Yeah, I think um, there's several ways to think about the border. You know, one is that line on the map and all of the kinds of horrific policies that different states implement at the site of the border itself. You know, in the U.S.-Mexico context, uh, of course, one of the huge symbols of that form of border violence is the border wall itself. <laughs> Um, and the building and construction of militarized walls, which is expanding all over the world. But increasingly, borders are outsourced, um, which is to say that borders are no longer on the line on the map, as you said, um, but are outsourced. And of course, Europe is such a prime example of that, the ways in which European countries and the EU are increasingly outsourcing border violence and border, um, border enforcement far beyond the EU itself. So it's not even at the sort of um, the, the countries that form the fortress of the EU, but increasingly outsourced to countries in, for example, the Sahel region of Africa and to Turkey. Um, you know, we know that in countries like Libya and Turkey and um, the Rwanda plan, all of these third countries are conscripted into border violence. Um, and that is done through a range of methods. You know, some is by dangling trade and aid agreements over countries. Um, so, uh, you know, over 26 African countries can no longer receive trade or aid agreements or sign trade or aid agreements with the EU unless they agree to migration prevention campaigns. It's a condition. Um, and so, you know, we see imperialism continuing not only as a way, uh, you know, imperialism is not only implicated in why people are forced to move. We know that imperialism is one of the main reasons, imperial conquest, um, imperial trade agreements, the unequal distribution of, of the impacts of climate change. All of these not only create mass displacements in unequal ways, but we also see how now imperial relations dictate that certain countries have to accept migration prevention in order to enter into agreements uh, with the EU, for example. That said, of course, there are countries who are very complicit and happy uh, to do the bidding of globalized border violence, Turkey, for example. Um, and so, you know, those are some of the ways in which border violence is externalized so that, you know, we see in the case of the EU, the border is not around the EU anymore. It is increasingly further and further south. In the case of the United States, the US um, Department of Homeland Security has had officials themselves declare that our southern border is no longer our border with Mexico, it's our border with Guatemala and now further and further south as well. And so the, the kind of frontiers of border militarization are increasingly not the core rich imperial countries, it is actually increasingly countries in the periphery, um, you know, Mexico now deports more Central Americans than the United States does because those migrants never even make it into the United States. And so in this way, we can see that the um, violence of borders is literally multiplying and pro proliferating and thickening all around the world. And there's so many more examples. Um, I will say in brief, yeah. the other flip side of that is the border is internalized, right? So even if you're a migrant who crosses into the nation state, the border continues to follow you. You can be picked up by immigration enforcement, through raids, through um, you know the police to prison pipeline, et cetera. So the border is is following you all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the UK, um, the, the what we call the hostile environment is a is a very mm -hmm. clear um, in, example of that. And this yeah. idea that uh, the government can extend its reach, can it can make um, doctors, agents, and landlords uh, can make um, employers into effectively border guards by uh, demanding this kind of uh, documentation checks, these right to work checks uh, at every uh, layer of social life. 
and so the expansion of, of the border entirely across the country so that you know there is no border it's just uh, uh, an exclusion zone as you describe it you know that the people who can and cannot access uh, services as, as basic as you know, healthcare, um, mm -hmm. as, as housing, as, as, as employment. Yeah, and um, thank you for pointing out, you know, also the ways in which it impacts our struggles, right? So for labor unions, it becomes so important to refuse to become those border guards to say as healthcare providers, we refuse to do the job of immigration enforcement, um, as though, you know, those who are in the care sector refusing those carceral immigration enforcement type parts of the job become such a key method of solidarity as well, in addition to actually refusing and resisting detention and deportation to also refuse that in our own in our own work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, 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 the history of, um, of, of border violence, history of borders themselves, of nationalism, of colonialism is to, so totally tied into uh, capitalism and, and class exploitation, the exploitation of the working class, the, the creation of an exploitable uh, workforce uh, of, of cheap labor. Um, and we see the, the, the ironies and paradoxes of that playing out exactly um, in context like uh, in, in the NHS in the UK, where uh, the, the British government in the post-war kind of reconstruction era uh, really encouraged um, migration from, uh, the, from Commonwealth countries, those countries mm. that, uh, that they had uh, you know, colonized and in many ways created because they're countries that the British uh, drew the lines uh, of in, in the first place and established as nations. And um, uh, uh, whilst extending some rights, not, not complete uh, rights, as, as became apparent uh, kind of in, in later years, or, or certainly not permanent rights, like rights that could be taken away. Mm. Um, so, pulling a colonial or commonwealth uh, labor force in to help build systems like the NHS, like the National Health Service. And now uh, this kind of uh, grotesque um, uh, irony of uh, pe people working inside the NHS being asked to police uh, the provision of healthcare uh, to, to other um, migrants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, would you like to say uh, some more mm -hmm. about um, about the relationship between um, the colonialism, capitalism, borders, and labor? I think that that's a really uh, key uh, discussion. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add just one thing, riffing off of what you were talking about. You know, I'd, I'd add, and then the additional dimension in terms of what you're pointing out with the NHS is then also how quickly migrants become the scapegoat for austerity politics, too, right? So then. Migrants are not only policed, are not only, you know, then become pawns in the policing of other migrants, but also migrants themselves become the scapegoats for why our healthcare systems and other public institutions are falling apart because they're, you know, a quote unquote drain on the resources. Um, and so it, there's so many dimensions, as you know, to, to what happens yeah. and how it unravels. Um, and I think, I mean, you, you laid it out in terms of, um, you know, that historical arc. Um, and one of the things, that I think through and, you know, so many of us think through is that it's so important to understand borders, not just as a politics of migration, right? Because migrants and refugees are a completely state constructed category. If there were no borders, there would be no social identity of a migrant or a refugee. Um, but really the only function of borders is to um, really ensure the capital flows are maintained, in particular, the flows of racial capitalism by maintaining a globally segregated workforce um, and also a, a segregated workforce within the core countries, right? So you not only have a massive global workforce that um, is cheapened through borders, right? That can, where cheapened labor is exploited and extracted in sweatshops and factories around the world, but also that very same cheapened labor force is then insourced and can still be exploited because of the functioning of the border. So the border maintains a globally segregated workforce that serves the interests of capital. Um, and of course, those, um, those kinds of exploitations and extractions are produced and maintained through colonialism, right? Through some of these trade agreements, for example, that we were talking about earlier, um, that really enforce border violence. And so colonialism both produces the differentiated reality of our world and also colonialism maintains it um, in terms of maintaining colonial borders. Um, and you know, this was so starkly obvious in the context of the pandemic 
um, where in so many countries around the world, borders were shut down during the pandemic um, and people seeking safety could not move. While at the same time, those who represented colonial interests and the elite were still traveling around the world in their private jets, um, you know, border able to flout borders completely as they all, always do. You know, so the migration crisis is is not one um, where people can't move because on the one hand, we actually have more movement and mobility than we've ever had in the world before, right? Like millionaires and expats and people who are diplomats who carry certain passport with certain wealth can actually travel and move in ways um, that are unprecedented, right? But what we do have is the same asymmetries that are historic, that are as a result of colonialism and that suggest the enduring present of, of colonialism, which is that, you know, over centuries ago, settler colonists from Europe were able to actually move in and become settler colonists and enforce settler colonialism um, all over Oceania, all over the Americas, while Africans were enslaved and Asians were indentured, right? Like that mm -hmm. was the global colonial reality for centuries. And that is now reproduced and maintained in many ways, including through the border, where some people have incredible mobility um, and other people are forced into conditions of indentureship and forced to live in a colonial present that literally determines where you live, how long you live, and under what conditions you will live or die. Yeah, absolutely. I think they they powerfully um, they powerfully put, and we we're seeing in in the UK this these 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 paradoxes play out very very clearly uh, where the 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 elite um, is stands apart really from the kind of migrant crisis that the that the government. Um, is, is talking about, and even this language of crisis that the government really wants mm -hmm. us to uh, believe exists, right? This idea of um, that, yes, it's true that there's um, unprecedented speed of migration, but it's not in this rubric of crisis, um, or certainly that the crisis uh, is not uh, that which, which right-wing politicians, increasingly uh, so-called uh, centrist politicians or liberal politicians, mm -hmm. are, are, are really claiming um, it exists. Certainly, it is a, a crisis in the sense of a massive loss of life, um, but the way that, that it's being framed is not the loss of life of people uh, crossing uh, border regimes, crossing militarized um, deserts, or crossing uh, stretches of water that are intentionally uh, neglected, right? That are intentionally neglected by, um, uh, by boats that could potentially save lives, but surveilled by drones kind of flying overhead mm -hmm. and monitoring everyone's moving. Know, that, that's the that's human crisis here. Mm -hmm. And yet it's uh, iterated as the crisis is uh, the people coming, not the, the, the death um, that, uh, that is, are being caused uh, by um, you know, our government in the name of uh, protection against this kind of um, different, uh, different iteration of, of crisis. But we've had in the, in the UK until kind of very, very recently um, something that's very common um, in other places around the world is kind of golden visa. So if people don't know about uh, this uh, golden visa idea, it's um, or a golden passport is that some nation states are uh, saying if you invest a certain amount of money mm -hmm. in, uh, in infrastructure or even just in a business or if you employ a certain number of people through your business in our country, uh, then we'll kind of fast track you uh, towards a passport or towards, mm -hmm. uh, towards a residential visa. Um, in in Britain, this kind of um, in, in in the UK, this kind of kind of popped up on the the national consciousness um, after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and suddenly this idea of uh, sanctions on uh, Russian oligarchs, and it turned out that a lot of a lot of Russians have been able to um, uh, you know, extremely wealthy Russians have been able to uh, access uh, residency um, in, in kind of the, the documented sense, but also um, access. You know, housing and assets, and so being able to uh, kind of uh, buy up through this, this language of investment um, properties in, in the UK and effectively kind of hoard their wealth uh, in, in different spots around, around the world. So I think, this, um, yes, the, the way in which uh, we, we think of, of borders as hardening is really important mm -hmm. to bear in mind that actually for some people, um, borders remain uh, easily traversable and, and you know, kind of um, frictionless, uh, and particularly mm -hmm. those multinationals that are um, profiting 
a great deal from building those, those uh, very kind of um, militarized uh, border walls that, that, that you mentioned. So, you know, the, the, the uh, CEO of, of Circo, I'm actually, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he still is the CEO of, of, of Circo, or, um, mm. but possibly has, has, has stepped down uh, in, in, um, recently. But he's the, he's the grandson of uh, Winston Churchill. And this is something that I always um, think is, is so remarkable, Circo being uh, one of the privately contracted companies that runs detention centres, uh, not only in the UK, but also in, has done uh, uh, on Australian uh, outdoor detention centres. So you have this kind of direct lineage of a, you know, the global elite, of the, the, the colonisers and their, their uh, grandchildren. Are still benefiting from this kind of creation of, of exclusions and inclusions that are highly selective and, and exploitative. Um, you've written uh, recently about um, a kind of a, a, I don't want to say a, it's a new terminology, let's say, I don't want to um, kind of mis misrepresent this, but uh, increasingly um, given the kind of the global heat, heating crisis, which I think really is a, a crisis, global uh, warming catastrophe and, and, and mm -hmm. climate cat emergency that we should talk about. Um, suddenly, there's a, an increased amount of attention being placed on uh, people who are displaced because uh, of um, of yeah, uh, climate catastrophes. Um, you've written a, lo uh, a little bit about this, and I think you're, you're, you've got quite a, I think a, a, an important critique um, for you know those, those efforts to kind of. Uh, solve this this so-called problem that are uh, also kind of passing back to labour. I wonder if you'd uh, share some of that um, perspective with us. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, I'm completely sympathetic to and understand the reasons why, for example, there is a move um, to codify uh, a definition of climate refugees in the UN Convention, right? So right now, the UN Convention um, so for context, this is the UN Convention definition on what a refugee is. Um, right now, those are primarily grounds of political persecution. And so over the decades, there has off, there has been various kinds of attempts to expand the definition of refugee. Um, for many decades, it was, you know, that we need to expand the definition of refugee to understand people who are fleeing due to economic violence and economic factors. Um, and, you know, trying to collapse a differentiation between a refugee who is often seen as more legitimate and a migrant who is often seen as economic migrants and hence, quote unquote, a bogus refugee. So, um, you know, during that era, there was debates about trying to expand the definition of refugee to include economic um, factors so that economic migrants were seen as equally, quote unquote, legitimate as political refugees. Now, there's a similar debate to try to include climate refugees. Um, and, you know, to, to really try to codify that, to have states respond to um, and internationalize a response to climate-induced displacement. And so um, I understand those trajectories. I understand those instincts, especially in an era of um, climate catastrophe. Um, but I caution against those kinds of attempts to try to codify and expand legal language or more forms of just creating categories of people that ultimately serve the state's interest to create categories of people, right? Like the differentiation between a refugee and a migrant and a climate migrant and a climate refugee and a real refugee. Like it's just cognitive dissonance at the end of the day, because the reality is like people need to move. And, um, you know, frankly, we can't tease apart different factors from each other, right? Like Political violence is completely connected to economic violence. Economic violence is connected to political violence, is increasingly connected to climate catastrophe. These are not forms of violence that we can tease apart if we actually understand the, tr again, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the, the ways in which violence works. They're layered on each other. Um, you know, the climate catastrophe is not a standalone uh, kind of form of violence or impact the climate catastrophe as a result of capitalism and colonialism. It is ultimately a symptom of those systems um, that allow us to pollute and profit from our, you know, from the earth. And so all of these kinds of efforts, I think, ultimately reinforce um, the, the idea that there is some kind of legitimacy 
in a border, that we um, even accept that there is such a thing as a refugee and migrant, as I was saying earlier, you know, a refugee and migrant and all of its iterations only exist because of borders. And so if anything, I need, we, I think we need an alternative response, which is, you know, we don't need more and more categories of people on the move. We just need to abolish the border. We need to make sure that in an era of increasing displacement and immobility, people are not displaced and people need to be able to move. Like that is the response that ensures that all people who are forced to flee because of all of the realities of the world today, that people are able to move in order to have a life of safety and dignity. And also that we need to be ensuring that people are not forced to move because you know, the planet is not a sacrifice zone and particular communities are also not sacrifice zones. So that is both a call to ensure that we end the conditions of displacement that, ha that you know, that creates such asymmetries and displacement in the world today, and also that people are able to move freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really well put. And we can think about this in historical uh, context as, as well. Um, you know, there used to be a saying that there's no such thing as a natural disaster because the, the people who are affected by uh, floods are the people who are forced to live in a flood plain mm -hmm. because it is uh, the, you know, the most precarious uh, housing or be, because of the failure of the state to provide um, you know, a living wage, uh, reliable housing, safe housing. You put people uh, building on on um, unsafe land, uh, and then when a landslide occurs, those are the people that are impacted by it. Uh, mm -hmm. either um, killed or displaced. And so, if we talk about those as, as natural, uh, then we naturalize uh, not you know the, it's, we're not talking about the landslide. It's the disaster bit of it, right? That the disaster is that it 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 fell on uh, these, these these people who, um, mm -hmm. in in many ways, in a responsible um, world. Uh, wouldn't be uh, forced to take the everyday risk of you know, living uh, in, in a hurricane alley or on a floodplain or um, you know uh, on a, a mountainside that is maybe susceptible to landslides because of extraction and uh, the taking away of um, of, uh, of, uh, of of plants and uh, natural uh, mm -hmm. occurring resources that actually hold that mountain in in place. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that we've we've seen this historically occur and of course that that these similar kind of mechanisms of, of what can be claimed to be natural or you know this idea of like climate change it's it's just changing and the natural consequence will be you know uh, huge fires um that that make species extinct and displace uh, you know hundreds of thousands of, of people so i think yeah we it's really important um that we don't naturalize that but also we look at it historically and we say that following these these kind of events, um, there are consequences like uh, famine, or there are consequences like a civil war, the breakdown of infrastructure, and that these can create uh, new kinds of, of, of refugees. And if we start categorizing people, then we'll start kind of getting into um, this logic of the state, which is to parcel people up, ultimately to deny some people uh, rights and grant uh, grant them to to others. Um, and this, I think this conversation about, about uh, categorization um, brings me mm. to think a little bit about what the, uh, the UK uh, government uh, home secretary, uh, Suella, uh, the British government uh, home secretary, uh, Suella Graveman, um, uh, uh, said in, in recent weeks. Uh, I mean, it, it's difficult. That it's, she said so many uh, horrific, mm. uh, you know, incendiary uh, things intentionally. Uh, so that it's hard to kind of uh, pass out some of, some of the detail. Um, but one of the, the, the things that she's done, and she, she went to North America to do this, uh, even though it was for a small audience, the gesture of flying elsewhere, kind of as a global states, states person uh, to influence uh, global politics, um, kind of was affirmed for the, for the British press, um, I think, as was her aim. But she, she really kind of launched an attack on the Refugee Convention, the, the United Nations um, uh, Convention, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Refugees and the Convention on the Rights of Refugees, and coupled that with an attack on um, the uh, European Convention on, on Human Rights and her dedication to kind of um, exit that as a, as a signatory to, the, to those, uh, those conventions. 
the reaction from a lot of people involved in migrant justice was, you know, to 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 leak to the defense of these um, these these policy documents, these international law documents that do exactly as as you you were just describing, that ultimately uh, function to to parcel out the deserving and the non-deserving, the refugee who can be given protection and the the the, the so-called bogus refugee, the bogus claimant, or the economic migrant, if we so call them, or the climate refugee who isn't yet. Um, recognized uh, in, in, in the, by the UNHCR. So what kind of you know, challenge or tension uh, do we face or as, you, as an activist uh, academic? What, what would be your ad advice um, for those migrant justice organizations that uh, attempted to kind of leap the defense of, of these, um, these quite imperfect international mm -hmm. laws? Um, and Thank also, you. I should say, you know, when leap to their defense because they're, they're, they are offering some protections and maybe mm -hmm. the future is even possibly possibly worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Let me just first say I'm not um, an activist academic. I have no academic background at all. Um, so I'll, I'll just clarify that. Um, and certainly it, my uh, connection to migrant justice organizing is, is through organizing. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard, right? Like we've had the same struggles in the Canadian context when we were under an extremely right-wing fascist government um, that wanted to rip apart every vaguely liberal, um, imperfectly liberal, uh, angrily liberal piece of legislation and made very similar comments about the UN Convention. Um, and, you know, then you're, you're kind of stuck in this hard place of uh, having having so many critiques of these kinds of liberal regimes and at the same time wondering if the only kind of defense possible is a defense of these minimalist protections. And so let me say that I understand that. Um, and, you know, from a strategic perspective, I think it's always important to articulate a deeper critique because we know that one of the ways in which uh, fascist and right wing propaganda escalates is that it does so in the shadow of liberalism, right? It does so in the shadow of really hollow concepts like multiculturalism, um, you know, multiculturalism in terms of state official multiculturalism is indefensible um, because it is not actually anti-racism. It is not actually anti-colonialism. It is not actually class struggle. It is not anti-capitalism. It is a shallow and hollow representational politics, which is very similar to the the convention, right? The UN convention and these kinds of liberal frameworks of, of human rights um, are so problematic. And so even as we may feel a need to defend them um, as a tactical point in the context of organizing, it is so important to always say that that is never enough. And in fact, that was always kind of part of the problem, right? And to articulate, consistently articulate our own vision um, and I think as, uh, you know, from an organizing perspective, it is so important not to come to the defense of liberal ideas, only, you know, because we are faced with right wing attacks, but to actually unabashedly articulate our radical left internationalist, abolitionist, decolonial, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist um, politics, right? Because that is actually the only effective counter to far right propaganda. And so... Um, no matter whatever kind of tactical routes we might take, I think what we always need to be articulating that, um, you know, in every kind of platform we get. And so um, I think it's one of those both and things. It's really important not to cede any ground to right wing attacks on what minimalist protections there are, while also being vociferously clear um, that often those institutions are wholly inadequate um, and have often served the interests of, of the elite, right? That they are part of the problem and that what we actually want is a world without capitalism, a world with no borders, you know, a world where people are able to have their needs met and are able to live in safety. Um, and that means that ultimately those kinds of liberal ideas will also have no home. Like right-wing ideas and liberal ideas will have no home in the kind of political left that we're aiming to build. And so I think it's very possible. And that is actually the work of organizing, right? Is like we can walk and chew gum at the same time, we can articulate ideas through their complexity.
Um, and I think it's so important that we give people and offer people a radical vision and not become cheerleaders for liberalism um, in the face of right wing attacks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a great, uh, a, a great uh, colleague and, and friend of mine, uh, Jamila Hamami, who's the founder of the co-founder of the um, Queer Detainee Empowerment Project uh, in in uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, you know, they talk about uh, about reform to revolution, right? and it's exactly this: like that if you're if you're taking, you know, if you're there's never good enough. You can't lose this end goal of a, a, a entirely different. Uh, uh, vision um but that sometimes you have to um yeah kind of uh you have to have conversations that, that bring people with you uh, with, with without kind of ever uh compromising or sacrificing mm -hmm. that kind of uh, that, that future uh, radical vision um i think we we had a well we had a, a session today at at, at, T, at twt earlier today called uh, solidarity across borders where we were uh, looking at uh, how um, migrants' rights, um, but not only migrants' rights, you know, migrants' rights uh, organizers, but people who are engaged in broader uh, justice movement uh, can can and should be really kind of talking to each other uh, across mm -hmm. uh, language barriers, across these national borders, across you know across national presses, right? So you know we we need to um, educate ourselves and pay more attention to what's happening uh, elsewhere. Uh, so breaking down um, borders, if we, you know, if we really want to conceptualize a, a, a borderless world, then that means you know, knowing people working together across these, these structures and across these, these, these dividing lines of struggles, right? So whether that's mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, migrants' rights, our workers' rights, our queer mm -hmm. rights, our women's rights, and all mm -hmm. of these things together. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm always really struck by uh, how effectively uh, people on the right and activists on the mm -hmm. right manage to work across uh, borders and bolster each other, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's you know kind of in, in between India or and the US and Israel, these kind of uh, protections that government that states offer to each other, um, shoring up uh, mm -hmm. ethno nationalism in one place as a justification for ethno nationalism of a different iteration uh, back back home. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your kind of your your thoughts on, on how we can kind of look critically uh, at, at what the what the right is doing globally uh, now to kind of re-fortify uh, mm -hmm. and kind of try and push us further away from um, from uh, that that borderless uh, world which we must keep fighting for. Yeah, absolutely. And as you pointed out, you know those alliances are they're historic and they're also deepening and escalating in particular ways. Um, you know, in particular between Hindutva, Zionist, and, and white supremacist forces, um, but really other states as well. Um, and so, you know, I think a few things, you know, one is that we know the far right is also, is actually is fractured, even though we don't see it. Um, and so I say that just that, you know, I think sometimes it can seem um, that they are a singular social force and they're not. And of course, they have immense amounts of power. Um, and resources and finances, um, you know, and access to literally every institution that we don't. And so, um, you know, I, ju I just say that to remind us that, the, you know, this is not just about the right wing and the left wing. There's a, a fundamental power imbalance um, in terms of what we're fighting against, just to give us some fortitude in terms of what we're up against. Um, but absolutely, you know, I think that uh, the border is such a critical site. It's certainly not the only site of struggle um, when it comes to fighting against uh, increasing fascism and escalating uh, right-wing attacks. But I think, you know, so much of uh, far-right, right-wing fascist propaganda um, about, you know, who is desirable, who is undesirable, about the so-called culture wars, about their, you know, conspiracy theories, their replacement theories, all of that, um, the border is such a linchpin in that kind of rhetoric, right? Because the border is a site of fascist architecture. The border literally um, is that. The border is is a way of sorting through populations, is a way of ordering populations based on hierarchy. Um, and so uh, I think that, you know, there are so many important sites of struggle when it comes to fighting the right wing and the far right in terms of its various iterations and the ways in which it rears its head in so many different ways. Um, and critical 
to all of those different ways in which far right ideology spawns itself, whether it's, you know, anti-trans rhetoric, whether it's um, attacks on houseless people, um, whether it's, you know, overt uh, white supremacist or Zionist or Hindutva attacks, um, you know, whether it's attacks on reproductive justice, at the core of so many of those attacks when it comes to right-wing ideology is the architecture of the border, is the ideology of the border, um, is this core concept of apartheid and who belongs where and who has a right to life under what conditions and where. Um, and so I think that, you know, as we are fighting, and this ties to your earlier point, um, as we are fighting um, the far right in all of these different ways that we also see the ways in which fights against the border is a struggle against capitalism, is a struggle against displacement, is a struggle for queer and trans rights, is a struggle for labor rights. Um, and, you know, see those connections, not just as like separate movements in solidarity with each other, but really that these violences and hence our solidarities are constituted through each other, right? That they are deeply interconnected. Um, and so I think, you know, that is um, some of the ways, one of the many ways in which we fight back uh, against this escalating fascism and far right um, movement. There. Okay, I was like, and I'm going to maybe close this session because you're gone. <laughs> no, don't worry. I, 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 I disappeared. I don't know what happened. That's but, okay. Uh, someone, else decided, someone else decided that, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I think, but I, I think that that is, uh, it, it is a one, it, it is, I don't know, wonderful. It's, it's essential. It's the, the essential uh, kind of takeaway, I think, for uh, in this conversation, or maybe it's an essential uh, takeaway for um, a project like uh, The World Transformed. Which is that there's there's no justice for one of us unless there's justice for all of us, mm -hmm. and that means all of us in 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 in, in every iteration uh, of 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 justice. Um, I, I'm I'm very mindful uh, that uh, that we should we should wrap up because of the time, um, but I'd like to uh, yeah kind of um, pass over to you with you know with this 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 moment that I've uh, that uh, you know it's, it's kind of the emerging news. Um, that I've not, I've not kind of followed very closely, uh, but I think that you know that the, the fascist uh, violence that's taking place uh, in uh, in in Israel under the under the nation state of Israel's watch uh, right now uh, is is something that we should uh, kind of uh, end on and comment on. So I'll, I'll pass it uh, over to you to um, close us out, but um, maybe as a as a reminder, um, you know. What can we do as as uh, as activists here at this festival? Oh no, you you cut out for me. Building I don't know uh, solidarity. Me. Sorry, you cut out there for a second. So I missed um, yeah. I missed the last part, but I think I caught most of it. And you know, thank you for raising that. I think you know, fighting alongside and resisting alongside Palestinians right now and always and all people under occupation um, is such a key part of all liberation movements. Um, you know, we live in a colonial present. This is not a thing of the past. There are people fighting for self-determination all around the world. Um, Israel, as we know, is one of the most powerful states and militaries and propaganda machines in the world. Um, and so it is so important to stand in solidarity with Palestinians, to be unequivocal, um, in our condemnation of Israeli apartheid. Um, and really, you know, one of the key ways in which this connects to struggles against the border, right? Like the, the Palestinian people's right to return is such a crucial part of what it means to be part of the migrant justice movement. You know, we were talking about the UN earlier. The UN talks about the Palestinian refugees as one of the quote unquote most protracted refugee populations in the world, while saying nothing of Israeli occupation that gives rise to the condition of the Palestinian refugee. And so to be in the migrant justice movement, to fight for Palestinian refugees, um, to fight alongside Palestinian refugees is absolutely um, means that we have to struggle for a free Palestine, which includes the right of return for 6 million Palestinian refugees to their homelands. Um, and so this is, um, these struggles are, are deeply connected. Again, you know, the freedom to return, the freedom to move and the freedom to stay, to not be displaced from your lands, from your communities, from your villages. Um, and so, yeah, you know, the freedom 
of all people from occupation, from displacement, from violence, is part and parcel of the freedom to be able to move in order to, to seek a life of safety and dignity. And that's why it's so important that as we're fighting against borders, we're not only talking about borders um, as sites of struggle that, you know, because then that becomes like a humanitarian exercise, right? Of like support the migrant and the refugee without looking at the ways in which we are complicit in those cycles of violence. And so in the same way that we were talking about, you know, following the money of the border industrial complex, we have to think, you know, we have to fight against those very industries um, in the places where we're located that benefit from the occupation of Palestinian people and that our governments invest in. And so um, absolutely solidarity with the Palestinian people, solidarity with all people struggling under occupation, solidarity with all migrants, and these are the same struggle. Yeah, absolutely. These are the same struggles. Thank you so much uh, for your Thank time you. today. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, online program continuing um, at TWT for people who are in Liverpool at the conference, uh, the, the festival, not conference, at uh, the festival. Um, you can tell my, my mind is stuck in kind of an academic world. I mean, the festival is a festival. It's joyous. Um, there will be more conversations about the economics of my, migration, about migration policy, migration 101 for people who are concerned. Um, but want to know more because I think that that's really in, in, in mm. important as well. So if you feel that you don't know enough about migration and you've got questions about what is abolition, um, then read more, learn more. Harsh has written wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, texts and, um, and, and does interviews like this that are really uh, great to guide you in your, your thinking. And there will be a uh, action actually. Um, there will be a, a, a rally uh, taking place um, on, on Monday. The look out for that uh, if you're in Liverpool. Um, thank you so much once again, Harsha, for your time. You. Um, it's been wonderful uh, uh, talking to you and solidarity uh, and um, strength in all your in all your organising work. Seems to all of you. Yeah. Bye.